Okay, today yes, I'm very sir. happy to introduce uh, my good friend, uh, Carlos Lavernia. Carlos received his BS in mathematics and MS in biomedical engineering from Tulane University, and then later his MD from the University of Puerto Rico. He is certified by the American Board of Orthopedics Surgery. Dr. Lavernia has developed hip and knee implants and has conducted numerous studies in the field of orthopedics. His designs have been implanted in over a million patients. He has written many book chapters and has published over 300 abstracts and peer reviewed articles. In 2011, he was president of the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgery. And in 2015, he served as the president of the Florida Orthopedic Society. Dr. Lavernia is a long contributor to the department and its programs through research collaborations, sponsoring senior design projects, uh, the undergraduate clinical rotations, and providing uh, lectures like the one today to a student body with a particular interest in orthopedics and medical devices. So of course, as we all know, uh, surgeons all think that they're engineers, um, but uh, Dr. Lavernia uh, has the credentials to back it up. So um, without further ado, I'm happy to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Lavernia to present his talk on robotics in orthopedics. Thank you for this invite and, and this honor of being uh, a lecturer at the Wallace Calter uh, Lecture Series. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. Sorry I can't be there in person. Today I'm going to be addressing a topic that's been uh, a passion of mine for quite some time. And uh, I would also like to let all the students know that we have several uh, projects available to, to feel free to contact, uh, uh, contact me and uh, we will try to accommodate uh, a visit so that you can see what we're doing. Um, so let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so these are my uh, economic and uh, you know, academic disclosures. I, I'm passionate about this because I developed uh, with a group of uh, doctors, uh, the MAKO application for robotic surgery, and, and, I, uh, and I actually get royalties on it. So I'm passionate uh, for two reasons. I love it, it's great. And uh, I'm, I'm paying my children's school with some of the royalties uh, off of this pr great project that I did uh, over the last 15 years. So, um, I'm currently a, a, an attending uh, orthopedic surgeon at several hospitals. I'm in private practice. I'm one of the a few solo orthopedic surgeons in town. I'll go over that a little bit later about the economics of, of medicine. Um, and, and, and these are some of the facilities that I practice uh, in. Uh, they have amazing views. I, I enjoy the ocean quite a bit. So I want to commend all of you that are on the lecture on the, your choice of career. Uh, biomedical engineering is a fascinating field. I got started in it and I still am passionate and I still work and uh, write some papers. Uh, so it, it's, it's a kind of a major that you can actually just get finished with a bachelor's and go to industry and do really well. You can also go to dental school, you can go to business school, you can go to law school, and you can, you can be crazy enough to want to become a doctor. And it's just a very rewarding major because it, it's got many paths and every one of these paths is extremely rewarding, not just uh, because of your passion and your goal in what you're doing every day, but also because economically you do relatively well. So if you do decide to go and become a physician, it's a long path. It takes uh, many, many, many uh, years of, of, of hard work to get there, but it's, I can tell you all that it's extremely worth it. It's a, I think it's the best uh, job in the whole world. So you have to go to a, a medical school after you finish your undergrad, then, pre, then you do uh, four years and then you do an internship and that qualifies you to just do general medicine. Uh, Subsequent uh, to that, uh, you have to do a residency and you branch out into uh, the two big uh, branches in, in medicine, which are medicine and surgery. Uh, medicine is uh, pretty much uh, divided into two uh, camps, the interventionist and the non-interventionist. And uh, in, in surgery, you employ surgery to treat disease or injury. Um, and this is the most powerful instrument in the whole world. You can heal with this uh, 
you can make people walk again. It, it's just the most amazing instrument in, 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 in all of, you know, all of the instrumentation that currently exists. Uh, this is the amount of time you have to spend to go through this. And fundamentally, um, you're, you're looking at at least 15 to 18 years of, of hard work um, to get there. Uh, you know, and, and, and you sacrifice a lot of things. Orthopedic surgeons are sort of a, a different breed. Um, a lot of people think orthopedic surgeon, uh, well, you, can you look at my feet? And uh, orthopedic surgery is a musculoskeletal scientist. The fundamental job that we have is deal with the whole musculoskeletal system, which is one of the most uh, incredibly engineered systems in the whole globe. Um, we have two parts to our life. We operate and we do non-operative care. So because we're orthopedic surgeons doesn't mean we cut on everybody we see. So uh, we basically uh, pick a field. Uh, a lot of us in, in town uh, do one of, of these uh, specialties, uh, foot and ankle, sports medicine, tumors, pediatrics, spine, hand surgery, uh, shoulder and elbow surgery, and, and trauma. And uh, joint replacement, which is what I do, and it's, uh, in my opinion, the most amazing job in all of orthopedics because we actually make people walk that can't walk. It's a, a biblical profession. We can actually get somebody out of a wheelchair and make them walk again, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and you do the work with your own hands. Every orthopedic surgeon has to be a part engineer, whether they went to school or they did not, or whether they want it or not, you have to be part engineer when you're doing assessment, management, and treatment of most uh, conditions that we see. Uh, today, we're going to focus on robotics, and robotics have revolutionized life. Um, in the last uh, probably 10 to 15 years, they've gotten um, into every facet of life. Uh, it, th th this is a, a little crazy. This is a, a psychologist that's developing robots that, that actually help on the management of you know, mental health issues and, and help people with psychological problems. And uh, robotics is, is pretty much the branch of engineering that, that conceives, designs, and manufactures the robots. There are several uh, institutions right now that will offer and have a department of robotic engineering. And they basically involve uh, all the disciplines in, in engineering, pretty much. Electronics, computer science, artificial intelligence, mechatronics, nanotechnology, material science, bioengineering. So it is a very, very, very uh, um, uh, hybrid type of profession if you're going to dedicate your life uh, to robotics. Uh, and what's the definition of a robot? A robot is pretty much um, uh, a programmable self-control device that consists of electronic, uh, electrical, and mechanical units. And it's a machine that functions in place of a living agent. So it's something that we pretty much um, now, um, it's in our common life. We see it in many facets of regular life. It doesn't have to be something super sophisticated that, that that, that is extremely expensive. Uh, these are uh, some of the robots that I was mentioning to you before that actually are being used right now in, as an aid uh, for management of, of some mental uh, health issues. This is a robot that's currently used in, uh, in the airport to pretty much uh, screen baggage. So, you know, uh, when you go in there and you check your baggage in, you go on a flight, uh, there's a robot back there that's actually managing uh, all these uh, bags that you put in. Uh, there are robots that people just have fun with. Uh, and there are robots that you play with. But if you see uh, something like this, uh, is, is the video, uh, Tony, can you tell me if the video is coming across properly? Yeah, it looks good. Perfect. So they're being used uh, in, in, in different aspects. Uh, this is a defense department project where they're being used as soldiers. Uh, and these uh, robots will actually go out there and, uh, and chase people and catch people. And, uh, you know, they can go pretty fast. The design and development of these things uh, are of a lot of interest to the Department of Defense because they save lives. Um, this is something that, that, that just came out in the newspaper. Let me see if I can get it to play. Here we go. This is Amazon's, um, you know, dive into robotics. And this was in the paper just two days ago. So they have these uh, home robots that follow you around uh, in your house and you can be having a conversation with somebody or it can be playing a video or music. 
and uh, it, it's just it's it's it permeates life right now. And the price of these things are you know down to a hundred and fifty two hundred dollars. So they're not out of reach, uh, and they they they're pretty fun. I mean, I I kind of really like uh, to play around with this new technology, and I have in my house a few of these toys that we're pretty much playing around with. So this is a picture of your hip joint. Um, the pelvis is the, 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 the big uh, piece of bone that, that, that joins the torso to the legs. And uh, the, uh, can you see my pointer there? Is that, can you see that the, the mouse moving around? Yep. Okay, perfect. So this is a femoral head. This is the thigh bone, the largest bone in the body. And this is the pelvis and the socket. And this is what's called the hip. We call this the hip. And the hip is an amazing joint. It, it, it allows you to move and it's, a, it's the, the cornerstone of weight transmission from the top part of the body to the legs. And this is an x-ray of uh, two hips on the right side. You see a hip that's perfect, that looks round. The ball is nice and round. There's a little space between that uh, small line up at the top on the ball that that that's actually not space that's cartilage it's a cushion that uh, god made that puts in there that's got amazing frictional characteristics and on this side this is a bad hip you see bone touching bone there's no space this is called arthritis and this this person can barely walk this hip keeps them from doing activities of daily living it keeps them from doing you know, uh, just about anything that you do in life. And it bothers them when they wake up. It doesn't let them sleep. And uh, this is what happens inside. Um, this is a normal uh, hip joint. Uh, this is uh, some work I did as a graduate student in New Orleans where we use different uh, substances to rub out that, that nice cartilage. Uh, so on most of, of the students' uh, hips, young hips, the coefficient of friction between the two bones is lower than that of uh, ice on ice, which is pretty amazing. This is what happens in arthritis that gets all damaged by different mechanisms and you end up having bone rubbing on bone like I showed you, which is pretty bad. These are all the disease processes that cause you to develop arthritis. And uh, they, the most common one is osteoarthritis, which we have no clue why people get it. And I have it. Um, a lot of your faculty has it and they don't even know they have it. I know I have it because my knees hurt when I do a little, uh, a little too much with them. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune phenomenon in which your own body kills the cartilage. Uh, Post-traumatic arthritis is what uh, was probably going to happen to the Dolphins quarterback. He dislocated his hip, major trauma to that hip joint. Eventually, he will develop post-traumatic arthritis. And then you have infections and congenital where you're born with a type of deformity that keeps you from having the right mechanics when you're walking around. Uh, for many, many years, orthopedic surgeons, all they could do was uh, you know, take the hip out. Uh, this is called a girdle stone procedure where you just take the ball and throw it away. I still do this operation maybe once or twice every five years. And I do this only when I have a patient that's not a cooperative that's doing IV drugs that has um, many infections, uh, and I'm not. I don't want to risk putting a hip replacement in there. On this side, you have what's called a hip fusion, in which you joint the thigh bone to the pelvic bone. Both of these things, um, they they make you have major alterations in the kinematics of walking, and they alter the way you transfer weight to your legs and to your spine, and they're they're not very good. Um, so we came up with uh, a, a, a process where we replace the hip and we basically put, you know, a metal on metal on plastic articulation that allows you to really, really um, have a normal life. And, and these uh, hip replacements are incredible. Um, we're doing around seven, 800,000 of these a year in the United States. They're, they're, they're biblical operations. It's like, you can actually get up and walk from a wheelchair if you have two bad hips and you can't walk and you operate on these people. The modern day hip replacements designs have evolved and the uh, evolution of it makes um, all people feel young again. You can get people to play tennis, even though I don't recommend it. You can get people that can't play golf to go out and play golf again. And it's been called the operation of the century because 
Uh, the only thing that comes close to being that impactful on somebody's life is probably cataract surgery when you're going blind and they go in there and they, they put a new lens in you and you can see again. But it's pretty amazing to be able to make somebody walk. It's a privilege and uh, an amazing blessing that I have. And uh, you can have too if you are willing to put in the time and, and, and the effort in becoming you know, a fully trained orthopedic surgeon. And it will get somebody that's very unhappy, that can't do anything into a very happy person, regardless of the age. I have a hundred year old patients that play tennis. So I generally deal with the um, gold medal winners of, of their age group. I deal with people that don't want to sit on a chair and rock. They want to go out there and do stuff, which is pretty cool. Cause it's like, I want to be like that when I grow up kind of thing. Right? So uh, after you, uh, have a hip replacement, the top three activities are not only allowed, but encouraged because you want to keep the musculature around these replacements active and working properly. The ones below, uh, golf is okay, but tennis and skiing are not recommended. Uh, a lot of my patients don't listen and uh, they do it. So I study them. So those patients that do sports, I tell them, you know, that's great for my children's tuition because I'm going to have to redo your hip, but uh, you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and if you do it, let me know so that I can study you. And uh, we're studying all of our patients. I have a registry with about 7,000 surgeries that I've done uh, over the last 25 years that I follow. And they come to the office uh, once a year, once every two years, and we evaluate their pain, their motion, and their function. And that's where a lot of my publications come from, from that uh, joint registry, that, that, that's what that's called. So uh, the surgical techniques uh, in, in the 1990s were pretty primitive and, and they have evolved where we now operate with uh, spacesuits uh, in order to you know, help us not, not get infections from the patient or give the patients infection. The spacesuits are aired uh, with the COVID era now these, uh, these uh, space hoods are used uh, in a lot of the surgeries that they were not before. But in orthopedics, I've been operating with a hood now for 20 years. They're, they're, they have evolved. Now we have better air control. We have better vision and so on. But uh, unfortunately, most of the surgeries are still done with this very primitive set of tools. This, this is a saw. Uh, and these are measuring tools that we use in different parts of the surgery. When you go to my operating room, it looks like Home Depot. The back table has over 350 pieces that uh, are lying there for somebody to hand them to me uh, as I need them. And they come uh, in different sizes for me to size and trial the different uh, patients, uh, different size balls, different size sockets. And uh, it's very primitive. 80% uh, of the hip surgeries done today are done manually with these instruments with no robot. This is a, a grading process that we do on the pelvic bone in order to fit the socket side of it. And this is uh, then uh, implanted and we put a plastic liner on that socket. And, and, and then we go to the femur, which is the thigh bone. And we have to find that anatomic um, access to be able to see where things are. And uh, once we find that, we, uh, we cut the head at a certain angle to receive the hip. And again, see how primitive this is. I mean, we're basically putting, uh, putting devices in Mars. And, and you know today, as we speak, there's a couple of hundred or speak surgeons doing this surgery, eyeballing these cuts and eyeballing these angles. And so uh, this is sort of the process of preparation. Then we put this... Uh, rasp inside the bone that prepares the bone to receive the actual implant. And all of these steps are done manually. And as you can see here, when you have this kind of patient, it's pretty easy. They're skinny, you know where you're at. When you have these kinds of patients, it's very difficult to see where things are, uh, particularly when you're going through a very small incision on the side of the hip. So uh, the angle and sizes are estimated and assessed through these small openings and we actually today, pretty much 50 to 70% of the surgeries are done using one dimension. And why do I say one dimension? Well, this is an x-ray. What's an x-ray? An x-ray is a one dimensional shadow of your pelvis. 
And today, leg length, like I showed over here, this, this leg is shorter, as you can see by this little dot being higher than that little dot from here. This is how some surgeons are doing the surgical planning today. They do it manually. It's extremely, extremely uh, retrograde, but that's the way it is. Unfortunately, we, we, that's what we do. We like to know where the center of rotation of the hip is. Again, it's estimated in a one-dimensional environment. And uh, templates are now digital. So now we have digital ways of doing the measuring on the templating, but it's still done in one dimension, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. This is 2021 and we're still doing this. This is the way it was done when I was in training. So in the operating room, we would basically take um, uh, an acetate template and we overlay that on top of an x-ray. We would talk about the center of rotation. We would do these little marks with a pencil. And uh, it, it, it's almost like, like you're going around in a horse, you know, when there are people doing Ferraris for things like, you know, uh, making the baggage, you know, go right in the airport and like cleaning in the house. They got robots that do that. So Nevertheless, we've made major advances uh, through engineering. Uh, I think uh, without engineers, we would be back in the stone age in hip surgery. And uh, we've innovated amazing things. This is uh, one of the first hip replacements ever placed. It was done in 1940. And the materials they had uh, were actually pretty good. They used colochrome alloy uh, and they were actually pretty compatible with the body back then in the 40s i mean you're, you're you're looking at 70 years ago they were actually implanting these things for tumors um we have now created uh, amazing things and we've been very disruptive with the engineering influence and i don't know if you guys have seen this guy or heard about him uh, he's his name is ronnie abovitz uh, Ronnie was a graduate student in biomedical engineering at the University of Miami when I first got here, and, and he was on a few of my seminars. I got to meet him, and he actually is the founding father of Mako, which is a robotic company that I work uh, with for the last 15 years, which is now part of Stryker Corporation, which is a $40 billion a year um, market cap industry, and probably the second, if not the largest, was big company in the world. So this grad student from UM created and is the founding father of this technology. Uh, he now has another company called Magic Leap, which is uh, a billion dollar funded company. It's, it's had a few bumps lately, but, but it's amazing that, that, that this all has happened. So this was groundbreaking innovation. And uh, uh, this is the robot. It's, uh, it's called the, uh, the Mako and the surgeries are called Makoplasty. So, you have an arm that pretty much you control as a surgeon and you put the arm in the patient and I'll tell you how that happens in a little bit, but, but it's a relatively small piece of equipment. It uh, can be moved from one operating room to the other. And uh, it's right now um, in Miami, there's like four of them. Um, they're, they're expensive. They cost a million to a million and a half. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about the economics of robotics in a little bit, but fundamentally, why robotics? So a robot never has a bad day. A robot doesn't, doesn't have too many vodkas at night, doesn't have a fight with his partner and you know gets to the operating room pissed off. Um, the robots are very predictable. What you put in is what you get out. And if you're a good surgeon already without the robot, can it make you better? And uh, you know the, the question is, can you get a survival? This is a 28 year survival, 40%. Can you get them to you know, 90% plus survival? Uh, can you take an average Joe and make them better? Can you move that, you know, that curve? Can you make that better? Can you be a better surgeon? These are uh, knee replacements that I've redone here in Miami. They are crooked. You don't have to be a doctor to understand that this is pretty crooked and this is pretty crooked. And th these were done in Miami in the last 10 years. So, uh, and these were not like real bad surgeons. They were, you know, low level, not so good surgeons, but nevertheless, um, it, it happens today. It still happens. 
So, uh, you know, these are hip replacements that popped out of place. You can see the ball. This is the way it should be. And this is the way these guys are. And they popped out because the implants were not put in properly, uh, which is, it happens. The dislocation rate today in the United States is around 5%. So five out of every hundred hips pop out. And that's extremely painful, extremely expensive to fix, and it's not good. Um, so, um, with robotics, I am convinced that we're going to get to this level where we're going to have longer survivals and, and better deals. What are the major impediments of uh, any technology in terms of going into medicine? The two things are culture and money. And what's culture? Culture is that the older surgeons, right, um, uh, the ones that have been around for a while, they'll tell you, you know, Robots, robots are for people that get lost frequently, for people that can't see pretty well, and for people that are manually handicapped. I don't need no robot. I'm a surgeon. I'm, I'm, I don't need this stuff. So there's a major resistance in getting robotics into any hospital, into any surgical practice, because people just, they're, they're hardcore. They're used to doing something. They have done it well, and they don't think they can get better. The other issue is economics. So if you're gonna develop a robotic um, program in your hospital, uh, you have to spend one and a half million dollars to buy the robot. So once you buy the robot, you have to pay for disposables because in every case, when you're doing a robotic case, there are these parts that you have to throw away after the case and you use them for just one patient. Uh, so it adds between $300 to $1,200 a case, depending on the robot and the disposables. You also have to pay for software upgrades. That's about $100,000 a year. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about techno-economics. This is a lecture I gave at Holy Cross on a meeting they do every year with Mass General. It, it's, it's a little screwed up the way we manage these things. Right now, the cost of a robot get get pretty much assumed by the surgeon and the hospital. And why does the surgeon have to pay for it? Well, the surgeon has to pay for it because he has to take time off his practice to go learn the robotic technology. And then the first few robots that he does, he has to go real slow because it's a new thing. So he has to learn how to do it. And that time is money. So if you have to go away two days to learn how to use a robot, that's time that you waste because you're still paying the rent for your office you're still paying your nurse, you're still paying your secretary, you're still paying the phone bill. The hospital has to buy the robot, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, they have to spend a million and a half. And who benefits? So right now in orthopedics, not one cent is paid by the insurance company for using a robot. So the insurance company pays the same thing whether you do a hip with a robot or without a robot. That's the same for the hospital, and that's the same for the patient. They pay the same thing. There's no added payment for using of a robot. Yes, that's true, and you can look around and check it. It's amazing, but it is what it is. So right now, the people that benefit are not the people that pay. So it's a little disjointed, the economics of this. And uh, there is a lot of value to robotic surgery to society. Um, it does have a short learning curve uh, with, with, as we advance and become better at teaching this. Um, you can predict the implant size. So inventory control is, is better because you only bring two sizes. Uh, patient reported outcomes are better and you don't need that many parts in surgery. And I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, of some of the research I've done. This is a paper I, I published uh, uh, just this year, it's about to come out uh, maybe next month, I think, on the Journal of Comparative Effectiveness. Myself and a team of, uh, of economists and, uh, and striker uh, employees uh, wrote a paper in which we looked at the money flowing around a hip replacement uh, when you use a robot versus not using a robot. And this is another paper that I published with the same team in, uh, in last year in the American Journal of Managed Care, in which we pretty much showed that there's significant amounts of saving in using a robot um, for the patient and the insurance company. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, kind of uh, a different side of my life. I, I study economics as well. I like, um, I like to look at cost utility, a uh, bang for the buck. But uh, 
Back to robots, um, it, it's not just in orthopedics. They're using them for heart valve replacement, for prostatectomies, uh, for reflux surgery, for bariatric surgery. And uh, they're using um, the robots uh, to make rounds. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, there are doctors right now in certain hospitals that are, are able to see the patients from home, which is quite comfortable for, for us and uh, for the patient too, because they basically, they, they don't have uh, all these people coming in. So uh, there are three types of robots that we currently use uh, in all of medicine. There's an active robot, there's a remote activated robot, and there's a haptic robot. The uh, robot that I currently use is a, a haptic robot. Um, and uh, the active and remote activated robots are right now in the process of being adapted to orthopedics. There's an active orthopedic robot and I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. So the goals of computer assisted orthopedic surgery, which is an unfortunate set of letters that we're currently used for this chaos is to assist, but not to replace the surgeons. Um, if you go into the literature and you start reading and looking at what and when and how, uh, stereotaxis or for brain surgery started in the 1900s. They had these massive frames that they would put on people's head to find um, certain areas of, of your brain. In the 1990s, the Robodoc system came about. This started uh, in uh, California, Davis, California, UC Davis, by an orthopedic surgeon, a good friend of mine that's also a mechanical engineer. And they uh, created the first robot assisted surgical system. Um, they were not really uh, true robots. There were no automated sequences and you know, the, the, the doctor controlled it. And this is kind of the way that arm looked like. You actually had to do part of the surgery yourself. And then you use these probes to do the contouring. And the, the initial studies of this Robodoc were not very good. The, they had a lot of problems. However, they did go into three dimensions. So instead of doing shadow surgery back in the 90s, these people were major pioneers on this. They started getting CAT scans. The CAT scan is computed assisted tomography. And it's a three-dimensional x-ray tool to look at the three-dimensional structures of parts of your body. And this is kind of what a CAT scan looks like. This, uh, this is uh, different aspects of the hip joint with an implant in them. So these folks um, got in trouble a lot. So 18% of the time they had to stop the robot and do it by hand. And they had a lot more dislocations with the robot than without the robot. So it didn't go so well in the beginning. Like in most innovations, the first few steps, you usually take a few falls. But that's sort of part of the deal. 15% of the robot cases had to be reoperated versus 0% on the ones that were done without the robot. So this was a bumpy, bumpy start. Uh, it, it evolved in the 1990s and uh, around 2010 to 2003, um, several companies came up with these telemanipulators that were uh, robots that the doctor controlled from far away. And uh, this is kind of a, how it works. The, the surgeon sits on a console and has all these controls. Um, and basically these things are inside the patient and the doctor controls the motion of all of these parts remotely from a chair in the same room. Uh, in case something happened, he can run in and fix it. And he has assistants that put these things inside the patient. And so <clears throat> the, the, there's no real tactile feedback. Uh, these robots are really big. They take up the whole room as opposed to the Mako. And, but they're, they're great. There's over 2,000 of these across the United States, and they're currently being used for all of these procedures successfully. Um, again, the same issue happens. The hospital doesn't get paid more for the use of a robot and the doctor doesn't get paid more for the use of a robot. They still use them and they still, patients still want them because it, they're better, they're slicker, they're less invasive and they will eventually be used globally in just about every procedure uh, that requires precision in my opinion. So when you're doing a knee surgery, as opposed to hip surgery, you have a, a bow-legged person, you wanna make them straight. And um, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a knee I did. This was, you know, it's a little bent. This is a guy that was not knee. 
And when I did his knee replacement, I made him straight. Um, and I also made him pain free because that hurts a lot when you have that kind of a problem. But it's all about angles and about reconstruction. And this is a knee replacement device. It's a little cap that goes uh, in your femur bone on the knee. And this is uh, another cap that goes on the tibia side. And uh, we again use very primitive tools to do that. And uh, we started to play around with computer navigation and the computer navigation um, basically uh, is a, a, a tool in which computer tells you where to cut. Uh, you have an infrared um, camera in the operating room and you have these little markers that have these little reflectors on it and they tell the computer where you're at and then the computer tells you where you should cut so uh, when you talk about uh, arthroplasty there are two types of uh, navigation technology which is not robotic it's how to navigate using computer technology in the operating room you have imageless and both of these use either infrared or elect electromagnetic technology. And uh, this is the infrared tools that I was mentioning to you with the reflectors where the infrared camera, which is sitting in the operating room and the probe is in the surgeon's hand uh, and the markers are on the patient. So uh, the first step in robotic surgery as well as in navigation involves um, the registration process in which you uh, have to tell the computer where the patient is. And this is electromagnetic technology. Uh, Medtronic uh, pioneered this and basically uh, they, uh, they, uh, they, 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 they're no longer developing this because the magnetic issues and the operating room instruments, uh, they conflict. There were beepers that were interfering with this technology. I did about 50 cases with these uh, magnets and it, it did not go well. But um, when you start the surgery, you have to do what's called registration. So you register, okay, where uh, all the, you know, the, the, the different uh, parts are. And, uh, oh, I'm now seeing the questions. Um, so uh, I'm gonna just try to wrap it up and then go to the questions because I want to cover a few more things. So I apologize for not stopping. I just noticed the, the question uh, side on the, uh, on the screen. But anyway, first thing you do is you find the center of rotation of your body uh, in surgery, and then you uh, use these markers to tell the computer where the patient is. And this is the same process you do in robotic surgery as opposed to navigation surgery. And uh, then uh, you look on the screen and it tells you how crooked you are and how you need to change your cut. And the markers uh, that you put in the patient basically have these uh, reflectors. The camera's right here. It uh, reflects light back and it identifies where people are. Um, it also allows you to assess stability uh, where, where things are in terms of kinematic testing. Um, this is uh, the Mako robot. This is a hip uh, probe that we use to prepare the pelvis. We again do the registration process uh, when the, with the patient on the operating table. We have to put these markers in the patient. So we have to drill holes in the bones of the patient in order to put these markers in. And these are the tools that get attached to the robotic arm. And in a haptic fashion, we uh, basically uh, develop uh, a relationship between the surgeon and, and the robot. And the robot doesn't control what you do. The robot basically um, allows you to not get out of where you need to be. It's called a haptic space that, that's developed. And this is what the robotic uh, screen looks like when you're doing it. The green is uh, what you're gonna put in. And uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's the most fun. Um, it's a very unusual for a surgeon to use this. It makes you feel pretty, pretty light when you're doing these things, but you can actually specifically identify the center of rotation, uh, the leg length of the patient, the size of the implant. They're, they're, they're just fabulous. And, and remember in the past, we used to sit with a pencil and an X-ray on an X-ray viewer. And uh, remember my prior slide, this is how we planned these, uh, these surgeries. We had a, a piece, of, uh, piece of pencil and, uh, and look how it's done right now. We, we now use these, uh, these CT, computer tomography uh, type uh, 
uh, images and we create an image of the pelvis, you can see over here exactly where we want to put the implant and you can uh, move it around um, while you're planning it. And uh, it's, it's patient specific planning. It's, it's just uh, pretty amazing. Um, this is, let me see, th th this is kind of what it looks like when you're planning, you can move the implants around uh, inside the patient's pelvis uh, that has been imaged by using a computer tomography. And that's, you actually do three dimensional planning. So when we started playing with this 10 years ago, it felt like we were dropping the bicycle and getting on a Ferrari. These robots um, were just a lot of fun to work with. They really allowed us to measure leg length pretty accurately, the mechanical part, the offset, the inclination, where we're putting these things in. And this is a video of what I actually can do in my office. I can turn the patient upside down and look at where the bone of the patient is and where I'm putting that part. And that uh, pink piece right there uh, is telling me and the robot where the center of rotation of the hip that I want to have should be. And now I can flip to the femur and I can look at the thigh bone and I can go up and down and see where everything is and I can move it around. I can just say, I want a sagittal view and I want to move that implant here and there. And then once you're happy with where you put this, you actually uh, tell the robot where the patient is, tell the robot where your knife, where your saw is, and you go at it and it keeps you from getting in trouble. So it, it's just really fascinating to be able to do this before the surgery. So all of this is done before the surgery. Um, so you do need a CAT scan before surgery, which is a little bit more cost and a little bit more radiation, but it's extremely exact. And you can actually plan of where you wanna put the part, where you wanna put the center, um, it, it, it's just uh, uh, amazing. And the process, again, you put the patient on the table, you put these uh, sensors on the patient's bones, and <clears throat> you do this using a drill. And they're not innocuous. You got to know what you're doing. If you put these pins in the wrong place, you get into a lot of trouble. And these are the receptors with the balls that reflect. And then your, your helper has a camera in the room, and you actually tell... Um, tell the person where you're at. And you can see that the leg length right here, uh, the offset, you can actually take the pelvis, move it around. It's, it's, it's not only a lot of fun, but it's extremely accurate. This thing is, uh, gets you within a millimeter of where you need to be. So let me go a little fast. I got a few more minutes here and uh, just want to share with you how, how fun this is. Uh, we can just sit in the office and pre-plan the surgery and look at all the facets in three dimensions as opposed to the way we did it in the past. Um, so uh, I think I'm gonna stop right here um, so that we can have a good question and answer. I had a whole bunch of papers that, that, that I was gonna go over with, but I, since I didn't answer the, um, all the questions, I think that uh, I'd be happy to answer questions now. We can spend 15 minutes doing that. I wanna go through the questions that were sent to me. <clears throat> um, why is tennis bad for people with hip replacement? So these plastics are not made for impact loading. They're made for sliding and gliding. So when you impact load them, as you know from your material science class, you have a metal ball impacting a plastic piece, you're gonna deform it. And once you deform that, you have incongruous surfaces, so you're gonna wear that hip out a lot sooner than if you did not impact load it. So <clears throat> great question, uh, an anonymous question. Uh, how do I measure success? Well, for me, success is a patient that comes back and tells me everything you told me about the operation is true. I can do things I could not do before and I have little pain. I'm very, very happy. So patient satisfaction and happiness is to me the ultimate goal. Now I do wanna have a good X-ray. I do wanna have good position of my parts in the X-ray that I take after surgery because that's gonna tell me how long the hip is gonna last. Um, so it, it, it's a combination, but the most important thing is uh, pretty much uh, the happiness of that patient. 
Um, the, the, the way to contact me, uh, Alexander, is to go, go to my website. It's drlavernia.com. And, uh, you know, there's an email you can just send, uh, send a note, uh, to tell me what your interests are, and uh, I can have one of my staff or I'll call you back. Um, Paulina asks, are there image processing or various plane imaging uh, that uh, improve outcomes and could regulations be made that make it a requirement to have them in the future? Uh, very hot topic right now. Um, some surgeons are like ticked off at the developers of these technologies because they say that they're going to get sued if they don't use the technology. And, uh, you know, um, regulations to make people do something are not good. I don't like uh, mandating things to people. I think that people should want to do it because they want to do it. And if we show value in uh, the use of technology and uh, people learn how to use the technology, I think that that by itself um, should, uh, should be enough rather than regulating. Also, patients are getting more and more educated. They go to the internet. They look at your uh, where you went to school, the things that you do, and uh, they're very informed. I have 85-year-old people that come in with uh, internet articles to discuss them with me in, in the office. So information, you know, is just advancing. Um, you know, it's getting to people, and it's, it's just it's fabulous, you know? Uh, let's see, Alexander, if evidence shows that robots improve, okay, that, I already answered that one. What are the most pressing needs that I can, that I feel? I think the most pressing need is uh, dislocations and hip replacement that we need to avoid them. And uh, you can avoid them by the proper placement of the parts inside the body. And in knee surgery, putting in uh, crooked implants or putting implants that are too small or implants that are too big that, that limit your, and, and damage your results, you know? <clears throat> so, um, and, and another ad, anonymous question. Uh, they, wanna, they wanna know about the lack of tactile feedback in robotic surgery. So, so basically in haptic surgery, uh, you do get tactile feedback. On some of the uh, remote robots, you don't get feedback. Um, so there's a lot of sensors that are being developed now on special gloves that you wear that you use on the, when you're on that console that I showed that allow you to uh, get a feeling for what's going on inside the patient. And while operating with robots, uh, biomedical engineers are, um, are sometimes present. They're they they're they're called uh, Mako technologists uh, or a specialist, and the, the engineers actually plan the surgery for a lot of the surgeons because they basically, um, you know, they're 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 in the office with you planning the surgery, so that if you have a complex anatomy or you have. Uh, an issue with offset or leg length, they can actually advise you and, and guide you as to which way and how. And so it, it's sort of a, kind of a, it, it, it's a, it's something that, yes, there are biomedical engineers, but most biomedical engineers are, you know, doing work in the lab, they're doing uh, manufacturing improvements, they're not in the operating room themselves. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's usually technicians that are there, but it, it is, it is a, a big piece of planning a robotic surgery to have an engineer with you where you can actually sit there and look at the mechanics and the issues that, that, that are and have occurred. So Carlos, I have a, a question. When are the robotics gonna replace the surgeon altogether? Uh, hopefully <laughs> never. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, Tony, that, that's actually uh, a, a, a good question because uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the older folks they they think that the, the robots are replacing their experience, and the, the the deal is that that's completely incorrect. The robots are enhancing your experience, and fundamentally, uh, the anatomy of each body is so different and so varied so varied that they they basically you know it's 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 just pretty much impossible to to replace a human 
hand in there. And, and more important, uh, I can tell you, uh, patients that are older, when I tell them I'm using the robot to do their hip or their knee, they don't like it. They tell me that, you know, I want you to do the surgery, not the robot. <laughs> and they want you to touch them. They want you to, the, the human touch, Tony, is amazing. I mean, I have people that come to see me after surgery that I just examine the leg and they feel better just from by doing that. I mean, there's this mind power that you have that if you think that somebody is healing you, they heal you. And uh, the human touch is so important, particularly before surgery. They want to see you. They want to talk to you. They want to make sure that you're, uh, you're you, that you're uh, uh, you know a, a guy that knows what they're doing. And and frankly, they want the human touch will never go away. Uh, you know, I, I I'm not afraid of that. Well, and of course, the robots aren't making decisions. The robots are doing what the surgeon's telling them to do. So yeah. Um, yeah, but but, but 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 right now, Tony, artificial intelligence is coming into our field uh, very very rapidly, and the, the point, point decisions are 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 right now, you know, <clears throat> questioned uh, by by certain AI technologies, and 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 that's a little scary. But it's it, I I'm I'm embracing it, I'm learning about it, and I, I think that eventually. Uh, in diagnosis, uh, it's going to be extremely helpful. And in surgery, um, it will be as well at some point. Um, a couple of weekends ago, I went to a restaurant uh, with my wife and there was a robot that was helping the server and bringing our food and <laughs> things like that. Yeah, no, they're, kind of... they're, they're cleaning your house right now. They're, they're doing, uh, you know, yeah. and, and Amazon's bringing the price down so that a lot more people are using these things and are getting comfortable with the whole concept of a robot being a piece of your life or part of your life. And I, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the younger generation demands it. I mean, they'll actually call the office and say, does he do robotic surgery? And if uh, my office says, no, he doesn't, they'll go somewhere else. Because, you know, and, and the, the, the funny thing is that the data is not there. Long-term data, 10-year data from robotic outcomes is not there. And some of the four or five-year data, because it comes out of top surgeons' hospitals, shows not that much difference between a robot and a top flight surgeon, which is amazing to me, you know? Um, it, it, so, because these guys are so good that it doesn't make them any better. Um, so for me, it's like, um, it, it's like, it's like a lot of fun. I mean, when we were developing this robot, we would go on a Saturday, there were six surgeons on the development team for the hip and another six surgeons for the development team of the, of, of, of the hip. So there were two different groups and I was the only surgeon on both sides. And because, you know, I can talk engineering language, uh, there, were, there were about five robots in a room with about 20 cadaveric legs and about 30 engineers in there. And we would have these, uh, you know, pairs of doctors working on a leg and the engineers would come in. And I mean, it was like, to me, it was like a lot of fun. I mean, it was, it was a great Saturday. I would come home and my wife would say, aren't you tired? And I go, no, I'm cybercharged, man. I just spent uh, seven, eight hours in a room with this million dollar machine and a lot of really smart people. And you know what? And I got paid for that. That's pretty cool, you know? So uh, yeah. um, it was a lot of fun. And I made a lot of friends and and seeing these things go, go all over the world, there's there's over 2,000 maker robots now all over the world. In the U.S., there's about a thousand of them. It, it's it's just one of the most rewarding things as an engineer that I can tell you. Um, it's just it, it's really a lot of fun, and it's evolving. Now we have um, we have a back a platform for uh, when we're doing hip surgery. We've identified people that have back surgery after hip surgery. Uh, or people that have a deformed back, um, they need a different position of the parts. And with uh, you know, the one dimensional view or the x-rays, you, you can't tell that. So the CAT scans are bringing this new level of sophistication as to where to put the hip parts in people that have had you know, uh, back surgery, which is, uh, it, it's, it's like, like going from a Ferrari to a rocket, I see it, you know, because it's it's now integrating a piece that we didn't even talk about. Five years ago, nobody talked about backs, you know, 
And now it's, it's part of this thing and it's part of the algorithm for the uh, hip platform. Uh, you can actually input you know, the sacral tilt and certain bony landmarks that the patient has. And it'll tell you, no, you got to put the cup a little bit this way, a little bit that way. Uh, so it's, it's very, very uh, um, sophisticated uh, where we put these parts right now. Well, Dr. Lavernia, that was a terrific uh, presentation. And um, uh, I'm sure it uh, stimulated a lot of other questions from our students. So again, I want to thank uh, you for a, a great presentation and everyone that's attended. Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be part of this uh, lecture series. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.